Imam Bukhari rahimahullah was that his al-Mughira embraced Islam on a, the hand of a governor whose name was al-Yaman al-Jawf al-Yaman al-Jawf and therefore often at the end of the lineage of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah you would have the name al-Jawfi al-Jawfi was one of uh, he was the governor of that vicinity where Imam Bukhari Allah's great grandfather al Mughira had embraced Islam. Imam Bukhari Allah's father, Ismail, was a very pious man in himself. He was regarded as the narrator of the hadith. He narrated from Imam Malik Allah. He also accompanied me, Abdullah ibn Mubarak Allah. Ibn Hibban bin Dikat mentioned this. And also he was a very close companion of Abu Hafs al Tabib. Abu Hafs al Tabib was a prominent student of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And Imam Muhammad and Imam Yusuf were the most prominent students of Imam Wahib rahimahullah. And Abu Hafs al Tabib studied by the he was only he was a very close companion of the father of Imam Bukhari to the degree that after Imam Bukhari's father passed away while he was still young, he actually became the guardian of Imam Bukhari. He became the guardian of Imam Bukhari Allah, and he would and you know Imam, he nurtured Imam Bukhari Allah. As far as Imam Bukhari's father, he was a businessman and a wealthy, a very wealthy businessman to the degree that he left great wealth behind him. The narrations mention that whilst he was dying, whilst he was on his deathbed, he said that never has haram entered to the wealth that I heard, that I earned. And then he went further. He said, never has that which is doubtful entered the wealth that I earned. Not even that which is doubtful. And Imam Bukhari rahimullah, when he grew up, and they told him the statement, and he said, my father has spoken the truth because a man on his deathbed always speaks the truth. You know you're going to your Lord. At that time, you always speak, you always speak the truth. He said, my father has spoken the truth. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, was born, he was alhamdulillah, you know, healthy. But whilst he was still a child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away his eyesight. And the narration mentioned that his mother would make dua, profuse dua for him. In tahajjud salat, in the other salat, at all times she make dua for her child. Until one night she saw a dream that Ibrahim Khalilullah alayhi salatu salat is informing her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted her duas and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, has restored the eyesight of her child. The narration mentioned she woke up and she hurried Woke her child up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had restored the eyesight. Now there's many things which can be said here about, you know, the virtues of the dua of parents and having pious parents. But this was Imam, Imam Bukhari Muhammadullah Ali's, you know, parents. The man who was wealthy, who had great wealth, but who never allowed haram to enter the stomach of his children. A mother who trusted up Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Strong trust that she made dua for a child to the degree that a time came that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua and he restored the eyesight of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. And then from then Imam Bukhari rahimahullah uh, he, he became a hafiz at a very young age. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a very retentive memory. You know, Computers were devised on Imam Bukhari. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a very retentive memory to the degree that as, when he was a child, he began to study by a hadith scholar called Daqibi. And one day he was studying, sitting by his sheikh, and his sheikh narrated a chain of transmission from Sufyan, from Abu Dhubair, and again from Ibrahim, if I remember right, from Ibrahim. So Sufyan, Abu Dhubair, and from Ibrahim. So Imam Bukhari said, you made a mistake. He's telling his teacher, you've made a mistake. 
He said, why? He said, because Abu Zubair did not narrate from Ibrahim. And, you know, the young little boy kind of dismissed him. And he was insistent. He said, if you go and check your notes, you will see. He went and checked his notes. And he realized that he did not, Abu, uh, Abu, uh, Abu Dhubair did not rape from Ibrahim. So he thought, maybe it's just a fluke. So he said, okay, tell me, who did he rape from? Imam Bukhari rahimahullah narrated the entire chain of transmission. They asked Imam Bukhari when he mentioned this incident many years later. He said, how old were you? He said, I was 11 years old. 11 years old when this incident took place. Whilst he was still a child, he memorized 70,000 narrations. 70,000 narrations with what? With the chain of transmission. Nowadays, you know, a guy learns a few uh, narrations and he's the good style of his time. <laughs> it's true. You look at the state of the Muslim Ummah today, See somebody, you know, he starts practicing, he knows a few English uh, narrations about where to put the hands, the way not to put the hands, to join the feet, not to join the feet. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody looks up to him and he starts thinking that he's something special. <laughs> he thinks that he's something special. And this is really the state of the Ummah. At time you had 70,000 narrations. And you had these people who were humble for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Malik ibn Jinnah rahimahullah said, you know, if you really seek knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it brings humbleness in you. If your knowledge, if you're seeking your knowledge does not bring humbleness in you, then you know you need to check what you're seeking and why you're seeking it for. So 70,000 narrations with the chain of transmission. By the age of 60. He had memorized the books of the hadith books of Abdullah ibn Mubarak and al Waqi ibn Jarrah. By the age of 16, the narration mentioned that he went to Basra and he was studying with the other students whilst he was at Basra. And he was not right to think. You know, often when I come, you know, when I my students, I'm teaching them. I'm not, I, I narrate this. And he wouldn't write a thing. So the other students began to say to him, he's wasting his time. He comes here, he doesn't write a thing. So one day, after speaking amongst themselves, they thought, let's bring the topic up to him. So they went to Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, and they said to Imam Bukhari, they said, look, you know, aren't you wasting your time? You never write a thing. So Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, said to them, bring your notes, bring your notes. They say that they had gathered how many narrations? 15,000 narrations. 15,000 narrations. And Imam Bukhari rattled every single one with the chain of transmission on the top of his head. The top of his head. Fifth, and he was still a young boy. And this is why I sometimes tell my students, you know, who don't take notes, I said, either you're in Imam Bukhari, or you're wasting your time. Now, uh, most of them are wasting their time. But anyway, but this was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uh, bestowed this memory to Imam Bukhari, rahimullah, that at such a young age, at such a young age, he had memorized 70,000 situations. This was a, a prodigious memory of Imam Bukhari. One of the reasons for this is, look, as Imam Shafi rahimahullah mentioned, he went to his teacher Waqi. What did he say? He said, look, this film is not, you know, what you attain in the university or at school. This is Islamic knowledge. And then it is known from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the narration where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that the three people who will go into Jahannam, what are they? If you ever look into that narration, what are those three people? The first person is a martyr. 
And Allah will ask him, He said, what, will you, what did you do with the strength and, and the life I gave you? He would say, Ya Allah, I, got, I was martyred for your sake. For your sake. The second is a scholar. Allah will ask him, what did you do with the He said, Ya I listened, I spread, I imparted, I disseminated the knowledge that you bestowed upon me and that you granted me. And the third person is a person who is of great wealth. Allah has given him the dunya. You know, most of the people go astray because of the dunya. And they will say, you know, I built a masjid. I did this and I did that with the wealth that you gave. And Allah will say to all three of them, oh, you did it. You know, so people say, you could say you're brave, you're the man. You did it because, so people say, what is scholar? How knowledgeable he is. He spent the depths of the night, you know, memorizing arguments, reading books. So tomorrow you can go and argue with people. So you can go to university and college or street, stand on the street corner of your masjid and have, have a debate. So he used to say before, wawa. And you got your wawa in the dunya, now it's kaka. <laughs> the man of the dunya. The wealth. See, if you look at these three things, this creation is amazing. The most, the most, the greatest sacrifice that a person can give, the ultimate sacrifice is your life. But your life doesn't take you to Jannah, it takes you to Jannah. The most purest of words are the words of Allah and His Rasul. No words are more purer than the words of Allah and His Rasul. But you're quoting Allah and His Rasul, but it takes you to Jahan. The vast majority of people who, who, who lose their way to Allah is because of the dunya. This man spent apparently in the path of Allah, but it took him into the fire of Jahan. Took him into the fire of Jahan. This is why it's important, you know, people who are seekers of knowledge, no matter what level, even if you're reading a book, you're reading it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, that book makes a change in you. It has an impact on the heart. And if your only sole reason is so because, you know, you, you can prove a fact to people, then subhanAllah, Allah is watching and Allah knows what's in the heart. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed Imam Bukhari with this a, a prodigious memory. When he went to Baghdad, the narrations mentioned that the ulama of Baghdad, they heard about Imam Bukhari's memory. It's great hadith. So what they did, is that they gathered and they gave narrations to, to the youngsters, to, to, sorry, to the Muhaddithin. So, ten narrations were given to ten different people. And what they did is that they took, because a hadith is made of two things, one is the, one is the matlan and one is the sanad, the, one is the chain of transmission and one is the text. So what they did is that they took the chain of transmission from this narration and they attached it to another narration. And they took a chain of transmission from this and attached it to another. And they mixed all of them up. So the people came and they stood in front of Imam Bukhari. And there were many people gathered there. And the first person, and, and the first person, so the first person came, ten narrations. And he narrated these ten narrations. And Imam Bukhari goes, never heard of this narration. Second narration, never heard of this narration. Third narration, never heard of this narration. Ten narrations, and he doesn't know any of them. Any of them. SubhanAllah. Ten narrations. So the people are looking, this is meant to be the Imam, Amirul Mu'mineen for Hadith. Imam in Hadith. So the next person comes. Ten narrations. Ten narrations doesn't know any of them. Third person, ten narrations. So I'm, I don't recognize any of these narrations. But they're breaking the chain of transmission with the hadith. Third person, hundred narrations. And this is meant to be the imam in hadith. And the people start saying, you know what? We know more hadith than he does. He doesn't seem to know any hadith. But this was the humility of Imam Bukhari of Allah. Imam Malik. You know, Imam Malik, a group of people came to Imam Malik from Spain. And they asked Imam Malik questions. Imam Malik said, I don't know. 
another one, I don't know. And the, imam, and the man said, look, Imam Malik, I've come from Spain. What, I'm gonna, what am I going to tell the people of Spain? That I came to the Imam of Darul Hijra, the Imam of Medina, and he didn't know these questions? And he said, tell, go and tell him that Malik didn't know. That Malik didn't know. So a hundred narrations are narrated, and he doesn't know what of them. And the people, the ulama understood, because the chain of transmission had been mixed. But the general public thought, you know, this guy doesn't know anything, we know more than he does. And then, Imam Bukhari made the first one stand up, and he said, I don't recognize the chain of transmission that you narrated in the hadith, but I've heard it with this chain of transmission. So he bought the right chain of transmission and then the right narration. And firstly, before he did this, he quoted to him the wrong one that he, he narrated. And in the entire hundred, he bought the right trend, chain of transmission and with the right narration. And he also quoted the narration that that person quoted. So Ibn Hajar al-Sqalani says, he said, it's not, it's not, Amazing that Imam Bukhari managed to put the chain of transmission in the right place. The amazing thing is that he managed to re-quote re the narration that that person narrated. Although he only heard it once. He only heard it once. But he managed to re-quote it. When he went to Samarqand, Samarqand, and look, the, the muhaddithin of that time weren't like the muhaddithin of this time. The muhaddithin of that time knew hundreds and thousands of narrations. Imam Bukhari himself says, you know, I knew a hundred thousand sahih hadith and I had memorized two hundred thousand da'if hadith. Why would you memorize da'if hadith? So you would know the difference. As soon as you heard a narration, you know it was da'if. So you went to Samarqand, four hundred of the top muhaddithin of Samarqand had gathered to test Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. 400 of them. And for seven days they tested them. Every single narration they quoted, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah put it in the in its right place. Every single one. But see, this comes with sacrifice. This comes with sacrifice. A man like Imam Bukhari, right, he sacrificed. Look at his travels. He went from one place to the other, from the other place to the other. It wasn't like, you know, you jumped on the PIA or the British Airways or Saudi Airlines and you went to study. You would travel for months. He mentions one day he went out to seek knowledge and his provisions finished on the way. For three days, all he ate was grass. For three days, all he ate was grass. And nowadays, SubhanAllah, the access of knowledge is so easy. It's so easy, but there's no desire for it. There's no thirst for it. These scholars traveled for months and they would go to a person and they would see him deceiving a horse and they would leave his narration for months. Today it's easy. You have, you have halakas in your local masjid. You can actually do the Alamiya course locally. We study we had to go to a Darul Aloom or a Madarsa where you have, would have, you know, where the conditions were very nice. We couldn't study in our local masjids. It wasn't available. You would be given, you would be given meat curry without any meat in it. <laughs> it was like dar in the morning, dar in the afternoon, dar in the evening. We, we used to get these jam puffs. There's some, if the Darul students, old Darul students, they will remember. We would get these jam puffs, which by Allah had no jam in them. <laughs> had no jam in them. But now, subhanAllah, so I ask you, you're sitting here studying Imam Bukhari, and I'm telling you about Imam Bukhari. So how does it impact your life? How does it impact your life? How does it impact my life? If Imam Bukhari ate grass for three days, he traveled from one place to the other, one place to the other. Basra, he mentioned, I went four times myself. So how does it impact your life? What, the, what will you take from this? It will be saying you go home and it has no impact on you. Will it have an impact on you? Will it create a fikr inside you? That you need to seek knowledge. What's your long time goals? 
Somebody asked Imam Bukhari rahimullah, what is the reason? How do you get this prodigious memory? What is the secret? SubhanAllah. He said, you know what he said? He said, high aspirations. He said, I endeavor, I try, high aspiration. What's your aspirations? And the state of the Ummah is in the state because of, you know, our aspirations. We don't have any aspirations. The best we do is easy knowledge. Go home, type in Mulana Suleiman Ghani, Sheikh Akram Nadwi, and listen to it on YouTube. Yeah, then you feel all, mashallah, easy dawah. Alhamdulillah, it's better than nothing, you can be doing something else. But, it, but these are not goals for Muslims, let me tell you. Don't delude yourself. Don't delude yourself. These are not goals that Muslims have. have. Muslims are the high aspiration. When you, the only reason that we look into the life of our predecessors is to take something from it. But the problem is what's happened, we just live of our legacy. That's all we do. We listen, we talk about Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, and you know, Rahmatullah alayhim. But what changes are making our life? No changes. It's just a mashallah, wah wah, great people. But how does it impact our life? Because you know what? This will be a hujjah against us on the day of judgment. And this is what my dear respected brothers, you know, the thing is, that take something away. Have long term goals. For the dunya, you have long term goals. For the dunya, you have long term goals. And the Prophet said, Lo ibn Adam wa min Big goals. You know, you got two shops, you want three. You, you work on a good job, you want promotion. But what about your akhirah? What's your goal for your akhirah? Because see, the best way of spending your life is in a manner which actually outlives your life, outlives your existence. You do something, you leave something behind you. And in the Islamic narrative, we call it Sadqa Jariya. You teach somebody, like MashaAllah Mawlana is doing here, and Mawlana Mujahid and Mawlana Wais and many others. You know, they're, they're, they're teaching. You know, you erect an institute, you change people's life, you help a yateen. This is what Muslims should have. Muslims should have long-term goals. For dunya we have long-term goals, for our deen we have no goals at all. So Imam Buhari rahimullah, my, my time is then, I've only started with the life of Muhammad. This was a sacrifice of Imam Bukhari This was a sacrifice. You know, one of the students of Imam Bukhari says that I, I happened to spend a night in the same room as Imam Bukhari one night. He says, in one night, one night, Imam Bukhari woke up 18 times. He remembered something. 18 times. He got up, he didn't switch the uh, light on. He lit the lantern, he took out his books, he took out the ink, and 18, he went to sleep again, and then he remembered something, and he woke up again, 18 times in one night. This is why you have acceptance in his book. But these people were people who were close to Allah. They had a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah loved, loved, loved to shoot an arrow, archly loved it. If they mention that only twice in his life did he miss, miss the target. Twice. At times he, he, he wouldn't get to sleep, but a lot of times I'll just briefly mention it. He, he wouldn't, because there was jihad taking by a near plane by, he said, just in case I have to go and fight. But look at his book. How was his book compiled? But the acceptance was because there were people close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His book was compiled you know, in, in a manner that, subhanAllah, every single narration that he took, he says that I, I knew 600,000 Sahih Hadith. 600,000 Sahih Hadith. And out of, out of those 600,000, and those 600,000 were 600,000, they knew the mutton, he knew the salad as well, he knew the chain of transmission. 
He said, out of those 600,000 Sahih Hadith, I chose what I chose. And he mentioned, I left out more than I actually compiled. 600,000 Hadith. Every single time, he would take a Hadith, he would do wudu, or he would have a bath, he would pray two rakat, and then he would do istikhara. This is why you have the acceptance of this book. The Ummah has accepted this book. It has over 130 commentaries to it. 116 years it took him to write the book. And he showed it to great men. He showed it to Imam Ahmad al had seen it. Ali al Madini had seen it. And many others had seen the work that he had compiled. SubhanAllah. 600,000 narrations out of the 600,000 narrations he gathers this book and this is this is the sacrifice behind it sometimes we pick up Bukhari what was the sacrifice we went to behind Bukhari what did Imam Bukhari rahimahullah go what were the child you know today subhanallah we speak about Imam Bukhari we say look at Imam Bukhari you know the difficulties that Imam Bukhari rahimahullah went through? He was chased out of one city, out of the next city, out of the next city. You know, I don't have time, but you know that there was an issue at that time between the Ahl Sunnah and the Mu'tazalites about the Qur'an, the created speech of Allah or the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and this had a great bearing. You had the Mu'tazalites on one side, you had the Ahl Sunnah on the other side. The Ahl Sunnah were led by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. But this came down. So generally what happens, and I don't know, is that people find it very difficult to have a balanced opinion. This is generally man's nature. They react to the opposite. So instead of having a balanced opinion, so you see something wrong, instead of having a balanced opinion, you go to the other extreme. And you will see this no more than you see it in, in, in the religious people. So there was an issue. Imam, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah came to Naysapur. Naysapur was, you know, a place where there were many scholars. You had Muhammad ibn Yahya al Ghafali, Rahmatullah alayhi. And the narrations mentioned that when Imam Bukhari came to Naysapur, they invited him. And Muhammad ibn Yahya himself said, Everybody go out to meet Imam Bukhari, I will go out and meet Imam Bukhari. Imam Muslim, who was a student of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, was with, with Imam Bukhari on that occasion. He said, never had that Naysapur seen occasion like that occasion. Never. No, had never witnessed. Literally every scholar came out to greet Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. And Muhammad ibn Yahya said to the people, he said, take hadith from him, because there's no man equal to him in hadith. As far as the aqidah is concerned, Nobody asked him a deep key that he should because maybe he might have slightly different, slight difference than us. So this is what happened. The Imam Bukhari came. You can imagine thousands of people went to greet him and when he gave started his dars, you know, the masjid was full. And then there was one, you know, you always get the one or two, the fitna among us. Now they're always there. So they asked him about the pronunciation pronunciation of, if you pronounce the Qur'an, if you utter the Qur'an, is it created or is it uncreated? And Imam Bukhari Allah said that the Qur'an is the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our actions are created. That's what he said. He didn't say but that lovely. He said our actions are created. So they said, look, he said that our, our utterance of the Qur'an is created. Our utterance of the speech of the Qur'an is created. And all of a sudden, a dispute took place, and then the people of Naysapur turned against him of Qur'an. SubhanAllah. To the degree that even there was, everybody was stopped. Now can you imagine? You talk about Imam Bukhari, can you imagine? People were prevented from sitting in this gathering. You know what they said? I love this statement. You know what they said? He's a deviant. He's a deviant. No, you can't. You don't know the difference between your head and your toe. You talk about deviants. 
Because you listen to some scholar and he tells you, yeah, he's a deviant, he's a deviant. That's exactly what they said about Imam Bukhari. You know what they said about Uthman radiallahu anhu? He's a bidati. This is history. You are the first people to, you know, conjure these things up. These things have been around a long time ago. It's just you're following this, the, the sunnah of those who are actually deviant. And that's why you're putting fatwas on other people as they're deviant. So they said he's a deviant. Don't sit in his gathering. <laughs> to the degree that he felt that his life was in danger, he left there, he went to Bukhara. Yet, Ma Bukhari had been chased out of Bukhara three times. He went to Bukhara, his own city. And then he started teaching in the house. So the Hakim, the governor of that place said, Bukhari should come to my house, teach my children. The Sahih, his Bukhari, and his Tariq, his book, uh, Tariq Kabir. Imam Bukhari said, no. He said, I will not disgrace knowledge that I come to the doors of the leaders and teach them. If they are interested in seeking, then they come and <coughs> seek knowledge from me. He was chased out of Bukhar. Then the people of Samarkand said, Samarkand, come to us. So whilst he was going to Samarkand, the people of Samarkand said, you know, half said he's a deviant, and the other half said we want him to come. And subhanAllah, can you imagine Imam Bukhari is now in nowhere. He can't go to his own city. He can't go to Samarkand. He's living in a little village. And I'll finish here. He's, sitting, he's living in a little village. And Imam Bukhari, it, it's, hard. It, it, it's, it's so difficult upon him. And Imam Bukhari, rahimullah, his student mentioned, one day after Isha Salah, he began to make a dua. And I moved forward and I began to listen, listen to his utterance. And Imam Bukhari rahimahullah was saying, Look at Imam Bukhari, subhanAllah. He was saying, Oh Allah, the earth has become tied to pump. There's nowhere I can go. And he said, Oh Allah, now take away my life. Take me towards you. Imam Bukhari said, Take away my life. The narration mentioned that soon after this, the people of Samarkand finally decided that they were going to call Imam Bukhari rahimahullah to Samarkand. The night that he went, he, he put on his amama, he was taking a few, about 20 steps, and all of a sudden he felt weak. And he said, take me back. They took him back. The night of Eid, this was the night of Eid, and Imam Bukhari rahimahullah passed away. Now, I remember this. Imam Bukhari passed away whilst he was shunned, whilst he was rejected in his life. But look how the Ummah accepted him afterwards. And this is why it doesn't matter how people perceive you now. It's how you are in the eyes of Allah. How you are in the eyes of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who appreciate ourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Make us amongst those who appreciate the sacrifice of ourselves. 